there are some people who at age 65 have more sex drive than some people at age 25. It is a question of personal heredity and education. Both those things will determine how, how active you will be at any age. Uh, a woman, for example, was taking a bath on the ground floor. She couldn't open the bathroom window because it was stuck. Finally, it suddenly flew up, and the force of it, she fell out into the street, right into an ash can, with her legs sticking out. At that moment, the Frenchman walked by, and he saw her legs sticking out. He said, oh, these extravagant Americans. She's good for 10 more years yet. <laughs> now, they have a little different attitude. Did you know, for example, that even change of life Menopause, on Collins Avenue in Florida, one woman said to a friend, tell the truth, Sadie, have you been through the menopause yet? So haven't you been through the fountain blue? <laughs> Even the menopause, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't mean the end of sex life. Actually, menopause usually marks a beginning of a new sex life for a woman because Menopause means the end of pregnancy. The end of pregnancy, not the end of sex life. Don't you feel more relieved? <laughs> well, you should, because this can open a whole new page for you. No, not become pregnant. That's what I said. Menopause means the end of pregnancy. Uh, don't let age worry you. People think that age and sex go together in terms of diminishing returns. Uh, may, may I tell you, for example, of a, of a Jewish lady who moved into a brand new apartment on Park Avenue. She wanted to give a party the next, uh, next week, so she called up a painter. The only one she could get was a 73-year-old painter. She called him and she says, Mr. Paint now, I'd like for you to finish for me the whole apartment in two days. He says, Mrs., I'm an old man. I'm 73 years old, but I'm a good painter. I'll do as much as I can, but I don't finish today, I'll finish tomorrow. He did the apartment for her. He comes back, he says, Mrs., I'm an old man. I'm 73 years old, but I'm a good painter. I finished for you the whole apartment except the kitchen. I'll come back in the morning, I'll do the kitchen. It's all right. She says, thank you very much, Mr. Painter. That evening, her husband came home from a party he'd been on. He gets into the house, a little tipsy, and he puts his hand, all five fingers, on the fresh paint in the bedroom. The next morning, when the painter came back, she says, Mr. Paint now, before you do for me the kitchen, I would like you should come with me in the bedroom. I want to show you where my husband put his hand last night. He says, Mrs., I'm an old man. I'm 73 years old. Better you should give me a glass tea. Now that painter, paint, a painter, could have used the proper course in sex education. Now, actually, if we were to analyze the sex problem, it falls into four parts. One, the importance of learning, how to face the sex drive honestly, realistically, intelligently, and constructively. Now, that's a whole problem in itself, a tremendous one. Secondly, how to educate and develop our children's minds towards sex so that they will enjoy it and profit from it and be an artist of life rather than a cripple. Third, what about the problems of the unmarried in terms of sex expression? And fourth, what about the problems of the married in terms of sex expression? Let's first look at the problem of children. It is one of the most vital needs of our education today to provide an intelligent view and a development of wholesome attitudes towards sex in children. If only we could raise them to be free, honorable, happy people with an affirmative attitude towards sex, not an attitude of dirt or filth or shame. You know, children are basically quite innocent about sex. Any guilt or shame they have, you've taught them. They can't feel shame unless you've taught it to them. They must learn it in some way. For example, I came into a woman's home the other day and her little daughter, three years old, was standing without her clothes on. The moment I came in, she covered herself up completely across her chest, like this, completely. What was she covering up? Already she was ashamed. Now, where did she learn to be ashamed at the age of three? She sees Mama. Mama covers herself up like this. And of course, if you could see Mama, I think it's a good thing she covers herself up. But you do learn it. Actually, a child does not have any guilt or shame about it. 
I love what one little girl said to her mother when she saw her bathing her little four-year-old brother. She said, you know, Mama, it's a good thing he doesn't have that on his face. <laughs> now, that's the whole attitude. That's the way it should be. Why should, you, why should you give them guilt and shame about it by the way you answer a question? By your guilt and shame, they develop guilt and shame. Uh, may I tell you about little Willie, eight years old, who came home at 11 o'clock one night. Mama said, Willie, where have you been till 11 o'clock? He said, I was out with my girl. Mama said, I should give you a licking. But since you've told me the truth, here are some cookies. Next morning, he didn't show up until midnight. This time, Mama said, Willie, where have you been till midnight? He said, I was out with my girl. Mama said, oh, I should give you the beating of your life. But since you've told me the truth, here are some more cookies. The next night, he didn't show up until 3 a.m. This time, Papa said, Willie, where have you been till 3 o'clock? I was out with my girl. Well, Papa picked up one of these big frying pans. Mama said, don't hit him with that pan. Please don't hit him. So who's going to hit him? I'm going to fry him some eggs. He can't keep this up on cookies. What do you do with people, not 15, 16, 17, 18, or even 22 or 25? What do you do with those men and women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s to whom you can no longer say, wait, wait, be patient, sex life waits for you around the corner? What do you do with these people? It's a little bit cruel to just forget the thing and think it doesn't exist or to penalize and torture them with all sorts of ideas that they are degenerate, evil, sinful. This is a very, very serious problem. Now, actually, what possibilities, looking at it realistically, exists for unmarried people? Three. One, sublimation. Two, intercourse. Three, <coughs> masturbation. That's all. Now, what is sublimation? Sublimation, ladies and gentlemen, is a psychological word that means that you direct one drive into another channel which is more acceptable. For example, if you, come, if you come to me, you say, you know, I'm so hungry, I'm just starving. I say, you know what you should do? Make a boat. Paint a picture. Now, for a few minutes, you might forget about your hunger while you paint the picture. But sublimation is not so easy, especially in sex, except for very religious people or those who are, have enormously high uh, standards of religion so that they are able to sublimate their drive into that field. Now, Let's not spend too much time with sublimation because for most of us, it doesn't work too well. Now, you notice in high schools, they, they go in a great deal for physical education, for basketball, for football, thinking that this is a form of sublimation for these active boys, that they will not turn to sex when they express themselves in athletics. Of course, they'll express themselves in athletics, and then when they're through with athletics, they'll look for sex. You don't sublimate everybody as easily as that. As far as actual intercourse is concerned, in our social setup in America today, this is fraught with a great deal of danger. It isn't so easy to advise a person whether they should or should not have sex relations because what is good for one may be bad for another. First of all, there are so many disadvantages involved here. Social, social attitudes, even pregnancy. Imagine how a girl unmarried feels when she realizes she's pregnant. Just think of what tortures of mind and spirit she must go through, thinking what her family will say, what everybody will think. Already, she pictures herself off in Italy making pizza pies somewhere to escape all these things. I've always loved the definition of adultery. Adultery is two wrong people doing the right thing. Now, this is really an important definition because sex, ladies and gentlemen, is like an airplane. Now, is an airplane evil, sinful, wrong? It depends on the use to which you put the airplane. If the airplane drops bombs and destroys, it is evil. If it drops mercy drugs and saves and rescues, it is good. You can't say that the airplane is evil or good. You can only say the use to which the airplane is put is evil or good. Therefore, please don't look at sex as being good or evil. It is neither. It is the use to which it is put that makes it good or evil. It is neutral. If only we could learn to develop a sense of humor about sex, you'd be amazed what good that would do you. I've always loved Mae West's attitude. She says, why make a big issue about a little bit of tissue? <laughs> That's a wonderful attitude because when you, when you get a little bit of a sense of humor up towards it, you'll find that your little ball will roll better. You know about the school teacher in Philadelphia who took her children to the zoo to see the monkeys? When they got there, there wasn't a single monkey to be seen. 
She went over to the guard. She says, tell me, where are all the monkeys? He says, lady, this is their mating season. They're all behind in their cages. She says, oh, the children will be so disappointed. She says, you think if we threw peanuts, they'd come out? He says, I don't know, lady, would you? <laughs> now, there is a need, as I said, to develop an understanding of realities of sex. You know, even the army in the Second World War looked at sex differently than they did in the First World War. Instead of moralizing to the boys, they started to give them pamphlets and education on contraception, on, on treatment, because they knew they wouldn't stop it. It was far better for them to be honest about it. One man said to his friend, you know, my sister just joined the army. He said, she become a whack? He says, no, the regular army. He's the regular army with all the men? They, they, they'll find out, she'll take a shower, they'll know. He says, I know, but who'll tell? 